Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you may be. Um, as the uh, Executive Director of Resilience First, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this Resilience First webinar. Um, by way of introduction, Resilience First's mission is to help build resilience in business communities, uh, whether they be communities defined by geography or by special interest. And for those of you who viewed the opening video, I hope you gained a brief insight on our organisation. Since we started a little over two years ago, we have attracted a wide range of major companies as champions, as well as a host of affiliated organisations and members to our network, all willing to spread the word through best practice and learnings. Now, we've organised today's webinar to shed some light on the twin threats of terrorism and extreme, extremism, which have become more dispersed and amorphous on the back of the pandemic. The frustrations of lockdown, the opportunities to spend more time online or uh, and hook up with fellow conspirators, the growing ultra-nationalist dimension and the hate campaigns around EME and religious groups have all added fuel to the fire of both the extremist and the terrorist. Businesses should be prepared to prevent staff from being radicalized as much as protect others from being the innocent casualties. The pandemic has also revealed that there are other threats which demand our attention and resources, and how do we therefore balance these competing requirements? If preparedness is to become a competitive advantage for organizations, then we should take a more holistic view of our mitigation measures in order that we become more resilient as individuals and communities. To help us make sense of this topic today, we are fortunate to have secured the time of both two excellent speakers as well as an expert chair for the webinar. Professor Brooke Rogers, who is Professor of Behavioural Science and Security at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. You'll find the details of Brooke's academic career and those of the other speakers in your joining instructions. I would like to add that I, I professionally known Brooke and the other presenters for several years, and I can't think of any better people to speak authoritatively on the theme today, but from different perspectives, though I'm confident that we will have a valuable hour together. Now, before handing proceedings across to Brooke, I'd like to invite you to ask questions of the speakers throughout the session by posting your short written questions in the chat box to the right of your screen. Please make them short and then we'll get through as many as we can at the end of the session. Brooke, the virtual floor is yours, so please take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, it's a pleasure to join you today. And as you say, our engagements go back more years than I can remember. Um, I, it's, it's actually refreshing to be able to move out of purely COVID thinking, although I know that COVID will be a theme today, and to um, have a chance to engage with and introduce Sir Mark Rowley, the former Assistant Commissioner for Special Operations at the Metropolitan Police, and Matt Mayer, the Director of Security and Resilience at Canary Wharf Management. I'm going to briefly introduce the topic, just give a little bit of an overview of the landscape and some of the challenges that we face before handing over for two short opening statements, a panel discussion, and then a Q&A session with the speakers. I will do my best to keep us to time and to collect an assortment of questions to feed into the speakers. So I will move ahead with the slides and that's just moved on, thank you ever so much. Um, and just again, give a little bit of an overview in terms of the landscape that we're working in when we're preparing to mitigate extremism and terrorism. So when um, you're an academic, you always like to look at numbers and data. And we know that the data varies depending on the reports and information sources that you, that you engage with. Of course, in the UK, we're working with the four Ps, prevent, pursue, protect, and prepare. And there are various challenges and overlaps to each area. We do know that countering terrorism is a multi-billion pound challenge with the 2015 budget allowing for more than 2 billion per year for cross-government CT spend, 
This then increased by 30% alongside an 18% growth in the single intelligence account budget. Um, in 2017 to 2018, the UK government allocated an additional 28 million to the 707 million pound budget for counter-terror policing. Um, and the 2018 to 2019 funding for CT policing increased by 50 million to 757 million in order to encounter, in order to counter the evolving threat. So what does that threat landscape look like? Again, the numbers vary a little bit depending on the reports that you engage with, but we did see, of course, in 2017, that there was a mark, significant shift in the terrorist threat to the UK with a total of five attacks in London and Manchester resulting in the loss of 36 innocent lives and hundreds of casualties. We saw attacks on Westminster Bridge, Manchester Arena, London Bridge and Borough Market, Finsbury Mosque and also the Parsons Green attack. This of course is being managed alongside what, were, what we saw as 128 national security attacks in Northern Ireland between 2011 and 2017. Um, and the UK reported 55 security related incidents by dissident Republican groups in Northern Ireland in 2019, four of which targeted national security targets, targets such as public authorities, police and the military. If we look at the dynamics and the data, we can see an upswing in terms of the number of attacks overall. But if we look at specific, uh, specific ideologies driving attacks, we see that big blip in terms of the number of completed attacks, jihadist terrorist attacks in 2017. And that's decreasing over time. But if you look along the bottom row where we go 33, 24, 21, we can see that our efforts to foil attacks and attack planning ha have increased over the years. So um, if we look at the total number of jihadist re related incidents in the EU, we have seen a slight decrease with 21 in 2019 and 24 in 2018, but these continue to be geographically widespread. We know that eight EU member states suffered completed, failed or foiled jihadist terrorist attacks, which were the same number as in 2018. The number of foiled jihadist plots significantly outnumbered completed and failed jihadist attacks, and all but one of the seven completed or failed attacks were committed by individuals acting alone, while most foiled plots involved multiple suspects. The Islamist threat is viewed as the most significant threat, but the number of Islamist-inspired attacks obscure the level of activity related to other attacks, arrests, and referrals, such as to, um, those uh, related to right-wing extremism. We know that trends can change rapidly and fluctuate wildly. Changes in one area, such as number of attacks, cannot be viewed in isolation. So if the jihadist terrorist attacks are the tip of the iceberg, what is happening underneath? If we think about right-wing terrorism, this is definitely one to watch. We saw almost a fourfold increase from 2014 to 2018 and incidents of far-right terrorism have been increasing in the West, especially Western Europe, North America, and Oceania. The total number of incidents have increased by 320% over the past five years. So while the numbers might vary across reports, and while they might look fairly low in some areas, we are seeing a marked increase. While far-right terrorism remains a tiny fraction of total terrorism worldwide, we, um, we know that we still have to prepare for and think about the evolution of this threat. Far-right terrorism in the last 10 years has become increasingly associated with individuals and broad ideological allegiances rather than specific terrorist groups. And this can make it incredibly tricky to manage because um, the reasons for the attacks are not the same. The individuals can look quite different as well. We recognize that the attacks in New Zealand, the USA, Norway, and Germany are part of a wave of violent incidents worldwide, and the perpetrators of which are part of similar, similar transnational online communities, and they're taking inspiration from one another. Other data that can be of use and of interest um, to us as we look across the board can, um, can prove quite enlightening when we start looking at looking at the number of attacks versus the number of arrests that are taking place. It's worth noting that the risk that the risk numbers that the numbers of arrests, excuse me, for right wing extremism in extremism suggests that increasing numbers of people are considering violence as an acceptable means of bringing about change. 
and a sharp increase in disrupted Islamist plots also indicates an unprecedented level of intent and commitment of individuals, cells, and networks to use terrorist attacks to harm the societies they live in. And that comes from the TSET 2019 report. So while we're seeing possibly a decrease in the number of arrests, uh, sorry, the number of attacks that are making it all the way through, we are seeing a marked increase in the number of arrests. I noticed when I looked at my slides this morning that this um, information actually comes from the TSAT 2020, page 85. So again, I um, will update that citation before the slides are shared. Um, if we look at the arrests in 2019 per EU member state, um, and I'm just double checking where I am with this, it's quite difficult to see what's taking place in the UK because unfortunately our numbers, if you look at the bottom row, say that there were 281 non-specified or not specified terrorism related arrests. And we know that that's not the case. Um, and because if we move to the next slide, we can see that we had to deal right here with four right-wing terrorism, um, terrorism attacks, 56 ethno-nationalist and separatist attacks, and three jihadist attacks as far as the data goes. You can see that a few other countries, Lithuania and Poland, also had to deal with right-wing attacks in the UK, but the UK was the leader in this field um, in Europe. So pulling this data together, looking at the global trends, acknowledging that we have to deal with a variety of other attacks, including from the jihadist threat, from the ethno-nationalist threats, um, we can see that the trend, the global movement of right-wing terrorism is coming our way. And we need to think about this and prepare for this. If we think about some of the challenges that we're going to face, we can acknowledge that terrorism and extremism have become more dispersed and amorphous. We have to ask ourselves what the current state of play is in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic and ask about and think about the trends that are emerging around the world. We're going to see increased levels of joblessness, possibly with higher a more highly qualified people sitting at home, feeling frustrated, feeling that their aspirations are frustrated. We need to ask whether or not we should view the threat, the threat of terrorism and extremism in a new light and ask what can and should businesses do to prepare for the evolving threats of terrorism and extremism. More specifically for the purposes of this conference and for this conversation, and, and it's what I hope our speakers can shed some light on, we need to ask ourselves how can industry action translate into wider community resilience under the PROTECT program. So I'm going to stop here in the interest of time and hand over to our speakers. Thank you very much. Um, just double check that I'm um, audible, I think I am. Um, so thank you for that that scene setting, Brooks. So I'm going to spend just a few minutes giving some giving some take from my perspective. Obviously, having sat in the police CT chair for a few years, um, last couple of years doing a range of things um, and staying current with some of the work I'm doing with Rusi and also um, uh, with Sara Khan and the Counter Extremism Commission. A couple of points on threat I'd pull out. So I'm going to do a bit on threat and vulnerability and then go into what does it mean to the private sector. A couple of points on threat that I'd pull out first of all um just so what have we seen trend wise islamist terrorism has changed it's gone online um propaganda has thrown across the world scattered like seeds that connects into local grievances in a way that we haven't seen before and that's whether that's in the uk or in fragile states um the right wing has used the online world to go from um loners to groups and connect sort of global grievances and ideologies and we've seen more fragmented ideologies. We look at incels and right wing and extreme left wing and, and all sorts of uh, uh, bizarre combinations of ideology. Um, so you've got sort of multiple complex fragmented threats that are really hard to get your hands around. And I think that's uh, that's just a sad state of reality. I think it's also worth thinking about vulnerability. If you've got these seeds being cast across the world online and by the way that groups are behaving now, What's the chance of them hitting fertile ground? I think sadly it's growing all the time. Um, so if we look at grievance, um, and particularly if we think of the last year, um, grievance, I think in many contexts has been stoked by um, COVID. It's been stoked by some of the protest issues around um, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter and, and, uh, and Extinction Rebellion. Um, and we see the products of that with rising levels of hate crime and extremism, whatever data sets you might, might look at. Um, 
And of course, these extremist groups have had a captive audience to reach in in people's homes as people have been working from home or have been unemployed, depending on their on their own context. Um, we've seen increased numbers of uh, fragile states as states get damaged, um, particularly sort of weaker states, maybe in Africa and other parts of the world. Um, the state gets damaged and distracted by COVID, and that creates more opportunity for extremists and terrorists. And then, of course, we've got the broader social challenges that come out of this context that are growing around mental health and, and financial threats. So you've got both uh, multiple complex fragmented threats. You've got more vulnerable people, more vulnerable places. So what does this atomized and volatile context mean for the private sector? I think you have to go back to first principle and think about the lay the protective layers you can put on an organization because you're only going to have this complex strategic intelligence picture. You're not able to align a private sector organization against a narrow specific threat. You've got to align yourself with layers to deal with this sort of diverse and complexity. And I'd pick protect, prevent, and pre um, prepare as the way into that. Um, protect, there's a duty coming. I know most of you are preparing for that. Um, you, beyond some broad methodology sort of priorities, you're only going to get strategic intelligence. So how do you work in that uncertainty? I think many of you will be thinking about um, the learning that may come from the Manchester inquest, which is on at the moment about what does that mean for people who sort of um, manage and own facilities or um, are, are in the event management space. It plays into that whole responsibility around the public space that many of you will be thinking about. Um, secondly, and I think something that's probably less thought about, um, I think industry think, needs to think again about prevent. I'm using that as a shorthand for for the people in your business, whether that's um, your staff or, or or customers you have a good view of. Um, I um, I think it's highly possible that um, a disgruntled employee who um, colleagues know is having perhaps um, some mental health challenges is showing signs of allegiance to an extremist ideology. Um, gets involved with an attack and a subsequent inquiry will show actually within that company there were warning signs and no one did anything about it. I think that's I think it's really tricky but when you've got such challenged people you've got less sight of them now in your work environment because many people are working from home um, people are feeling vulnerable financial challenges I think that prevent agenda in your staff has to be one of the layers that maybe hasn't been the strongest. I know many companies have been doing a lot about the mental health agenda which I think does overlap to a degree. And then thirdly, of course, preparedness. Um, I, I'm really struck by the research of others in this field. I think it's interesting in the last couple of years, 2018, 2019, both Deloitte and PwC did big pieces of research work, which they published on um, on sort of corporate crisis preparedness. And th what we're talking about now, I think, is a subset of crisis preparedness. And the Deloitte 2018 point, report talks about um, uh, confidence, um, uh, outweighs preparedness. So boards of FTSE sort of 450 companies, I think, sort of being optimistic about their preparedness. But when when the questions get more detailed about actually have these have the plans been tested, there's a, there's a lack of testing and, and, and capability there. And I think PwC last year took it a stage further with their report, which is really insightful. I think it surfaced an idea which I like about um, preparedness being the next competitive advantage. It's not just a piece of housekeeping. We're in a more volatile, more risky world where most businesses expect to see existential crises more often. Um, and therefore, preparedness needs to be front and centre as a corporate priority, not a not a piece of, uh, of housekeeping sort of um, to one side. Um, so, uh, and I think that plays into the more volatile world. Indeed, I'm sort of I'm involved in a business that's trying to help people um, run tabletops and preparedness exercises in this in this new world. So as you step back, what have you got here? You've got this, say, this atomized volatile environment where you have to go back to first principles, I think, and think about your layers of protection. And I would think about, I would use the British sort of national strategy structure and think about protect, prevent and prepare and what the corporate sector can do to strengthen across each of those. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I just want to talk about and focus on really what what is, can business do or not do uh, for uh, in terms of the current situation. And just in context, I think we need to step even further back from the subject area, perhaps that we're discussing, and start with the fact that at the moment, forty one thousand people have been killed by this virus in the UK. 
41,000. That is in comparison to 1,700 killed by the IRA from 1969 to their ceasefire. In 2019, the number of stabbing homicides in the UK was 242, two of them as a result of a terrorist attack. And when you look across the Atlantic, 189,000 people have been killed by COVID-19. That is a greater death toll than the combined combat casualties of the US forces in World War I, Korea and Vietnam combined. And of course that death toll continues to mount. But as of today, it is 63 times the death toll on 9-11, which we remember this week. And as a recent article in The Spectator put it, when considering why the UK had fared so poorly in its reaction perhaps to COVID-19, it said, and I quote, pandemic readiness received little attention at the securocrat dominated National Security Council. Interesting to use the word of securocrat in the National Security Council. The inference of course being that security as a concept had been narrowed very specifically to mean countering terrorism and terrorism, not necessarily extremism. And interestingly, the defence minister sits on the main board of the National Security Council. The health minister did not. So what? Well, there are many risks and hazards in life. Uh, and really, I want to focus on how businesses today and in Q4 2020 uh, will rack and stack them and how would it view terrorism? Well, I think the specifically what businesses can do when they have already spent on countering terrorism, being it bag searches, bollards, run hotel or other training. Well, first and foremost, uh, I'm going to stick my neck out and say, I think in any boardroom right now, right now, and for the rest of the year, the word terrorism will get um, very little of a listening until the next attack. And I underestimate, underline rather, underline until the next attack. But right now, in the circumstances we face, uh, economically and socially, um, terrorism per se um, will be a hard sell for resources. And it's interesting that the, we speak of, uh, and um, Dr. Roger has spoken of terrorism and extremism, because I think it's different when you then start to take the word terrorism out and put extremism in. I think that will have traction. Because the companies have an interest in keeping their people safe and more widely society safe, I think there are measures that can they, they can take which are not terrorist focused and should not be terrorist focused, but they will lead to a safer workplace and a safer society. We know that there are a nexus of factors which lead to violence and damage, both within society and within the workplace, that lead to individuals taking extreme actions. And these factors don't have roots in the traditional seedbeds of terrorism, a corruption of a religious ideal, or a political concept, nor do they necessarily these days see their output in a terrorist act. We, have, we know globally that the push factors to organised crime, violent extremism and violent protest are many, but they include lack of prospects, economic vulnerability and socio-political marginalisation. Now they're big words, uh, so I'm going to get to pick up two concepts uh, and they are firstly a feeling of alienation. And this is where an individual doesn't have a sense of being part of something, not having a stake in something, not belonging. A perception of being alienated from society might be due to economic factors, race, religion, sexual preference, political viewpoint. I find it interesting at the moment the British Army's latest recruiting campaign 
as a strap line, this is belonging. This is belonging. Because the army has been told and advised, and I think correctly, that there are a great number of young people, their target audience, who do not feel they belong, who do feel alienated from society, who haven't found their people, their tribe, their cause. And the army feels that it can give a lived experience of intense belonging through comradeship, teamwork, a meritocracy, and of course, an idea and a, and a, and a structure bigger than the individual. So feeling of alienation and not belonging. The second one is disgruntlement, and this is probably more of a personal uh, sense. Disgruntlement with life in general, with your role in the company, the way that you're perceived, or you're perceived that you're perceived on a personal level. Feeling that you're a have-not, and absolutely no prospect of being a have in any way at all. And these factors lead to extremism, extremism of any nature. As Dr. Rogers already said, 320% increase in extreme right wing over the last five years. But it could also be joining a county lines gang, engaging in crime, joining a street gang, which ends up in knife violence, or any entity that gives you a sense of belonging and minimizes disgruntlement. And I think this is gonna get worse. I think it's going to get a lot worse, the senses of alienation and disgruntlement following COVID. There is going to be greater unemployment and there are going to be fewer opportunities. And we've already seen in June and July 300,000 redundancies announced in the UK. And that's when the furlough schemes run. This is going to get a lot worse and it's going to get a lot deeper and it's going to go for a lot longer. Now, this is not going to be just amongst the retail and the restaurant sector um, or indeed amongst some of the office work. Uh, although, of course, online activity uh, and such like is going to take its toll. But again, as Brooke herself said, this is going to hit graduates. The people that are leaving or have just left university who are not going to have their ambitions and their hopes met and they're going to have their ideals thwarted and perhaps they may be the more dangerous amongst extremists. And I haven't even mentioned, and I will only do so once, but Brexit. Do you remember that thing that we used to talk about before COVID? It's still there, and it still may have some severe economic impacts. I think all of that is gonna give a greater sense of alienation, economically and socially, a greater sense of frustration, a greater schisms in our society, be it wealth or employment, and it will lead to a sense of dissatisfaction and the blaming of others. And once you go down that route, any extremist ideas will thrive. I also think that COVID-19, and this has been touched upon, has exacerbated a condition of vulnerability to extremism and extremist views for those people that are in that position. Prolonged removal of individuals from their social networks, support groups and moderators at home and in the office as individuals become less connected with others, truly connected um, through remote working and online activity, as well as just unemployment uh, and other disconnects. And this could lead to um, you end up in an echo chamber where alternative views are not presented, mentoring is absent peer examples are missing. So what? So what can businesses do to stop that happening amongst not only their own current workforce, but amongst corporate social responsibility uh, on a wider area? And you can stop that extremism starting in the same way that currently, I think, businesses have been focused on bag searches and bollard lines, almost at the end of the Extremist Violent Act, actually now probably shifting to go a little more upstream and try and head it off before it ends up on your bollard line. Well, the good news is it's actually really simple, I think. It's really simple 
and it really can be a benefit to business. The second piece of good news is actually being done by the better businesses already, the better leaders, the better management, and the better corporations. First and foremost, show an interest in your staff in the workplace. So Mark's touched upon this. Make sure that people really do know their colleagues and those they work with, for, and alongside. I think this is going to become a far greater challenge with the move to working from home. Um, I think if you do Zoom calls, team calls, and all the other things that we've been doing, they're very functional, they're very focused, they're very business. What's missing is the water cooler chat, or the, hey, let's go for coffee, or the beers after work, where you actually really get to know people and get to know their interests. What do they do at the weekend? What do they do outside work? What are their views? What are their opinions? And equally, of course, they are not getting the mentoring examples to say open up to alternative views and that sense of uh, counterbalance. But I think companies have really got to work at that uh, in terms of knowing their people. I also think that um, employers have got to make sure that, that their, their people realise they fit on a broader canvas, that they don't have this uh, narrow viewpoint. They're part of a company or a team or a project or an idea that is bigger than them. Um, I do find it interesting that over the last six or seven months, companies have recruited and onboarded staff and have had them working for them for a number of months who have perhaps not been or very, very rarely been in the office with colleagues, mentors, met their leaders uh, face to face and gone for that coffee or gone for that lunch and really sort of, you know, uh, mixing and not feeling alienated. And the final thing I'd say is sort of employ the young. Take a training risk on a younger person and take a risk down that less well-trodden path. And can I just say that um, I speak as a white middle-class public school educated former armory officer wearing a tie. So let me just say, fewer of me and go and find people that look different, sound different and come from a different viewpoint. Bring them in and nurture them uh, and therefore stop any feelings of alienation uh, further upstream. So violent acts are carried out by the app alienated and disgruntled. They are going to continue be they acts of terrorism, but they're going to be just as likely acts of violence, extreme protest activity, gang membership and crime. Because of COVID and possibly what's more to come, I think those feelings will increase for many due to unemployment, lack of opportunity and isolation. But I think in terms of business, don't use the word terrorism for now, for now, don't use the word terrorism use the word extremism, and here's a thought, maybe we shouldn't have contest, counter-terrorism strategy, maybe we should even start thinking different vocabulary about that, but I'm gonna leave that out there. But presented as a wider problem to the business, different root causes needing different solutions, but actually mitigating the same possible outcome. And it can be mitigated, can be mitigated uh, relatively simply, to say good businesses are doing it more and more, but actually, uh, as the Mark said, it's people that are the clue, and people are the key to this. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you ever so much, Mark and Matt, um, and it's music to my ears as a psychologist that people are the clue, um, they, they are the solution, and we know when we're thinking about terrorism and counterterrorism that they can also be one of our greatest challenges. So um, your, your um, thoughts, you, you're both painting quite a stark picture, um, acknowledging that we have struggled with this in the past in terms of thinking about countering terrorism. And I love the way in which you're actually moving this further upstream and saying it's not just about the physical security for the, for the end of the planning, the point at which an attack occurs, but how can we move this further upstream and think about 
the psychological and social well-being of our staff. Think about creating a shared identity. Think about creating a shared purpose in, in industry and business. So I, I was wondering, as I was listening to you, first, we know that we've struggled with this in the past, and this question goes to both of you. How do we know when our initiatives are working or when they're failing and need a revamp? Two, COVID-19 has, has created a lot of remote working for those of us who are fortunate enough to still have jobs. So is this an opportunity to transform the ways in which we create that shared identity and shared purpose? How is that going to work? Is this a new way of working? And what, it's not just what do we need to do, but how should we do it? And I will hand over to you. Um, I'll have a, I'll have a stab at, um, I'll have a stab at that. Thank you. So I, I think the heart of the readiness in any of these areas, preparedness in any of these areas has to be, um, it, you're not frozen out there? No. Oh, good. No, we can hear okay. you. Oh, good. Okay. My, my picture's on my own screen's frozen, but okay, if you can hear me, that's good. Um, I think the heart of this is preparing this. And so I think if you look across, um, so in the protect space, penetration testing and those sorts of schemes, um, coming up with different um, and a red team approaches, et cetera. There's all sorts of options that one can do in that space. Um, I think with people, it's there are still ways to test how ready you are in terms of you come up with a plan, you do whatever training and development you want to do, you put all your systems in place, you do then you can do staff surveys. There's all sorts of ways that you can get into having a feel for whether it's working. And in terms of your contingency plans for this event, then again, testing, exercising. I think for me, that's at the at the center of all this is readiness because we're talking about um high impacts um low likelihood events and that's that's obvious um but most of your business you're doing every day and therefore that sort of you're, you're naturally rehearsed this is different to the core business you face and therefore you have to find ways to sort of prove and test that what you're doing is working um, the whole time and then you can look at peer reviews, what are other organizations, what other companies doing? There's lots of ways into this, get external experts in. Um, there's, there's a million and one ways, but fundamentally I see sort of testing and exercising has been at the, at the core of it. Thank you, Matt. Would you like to come in yeah. on response? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 do think, um, I do think this gets really quite difficult with remote working. Um, and I think as part of it's not, I, I fully accept that everyone is going to um, uh, change their working patterns 100%. You're not going to have everyone in the office all the time at all. Um, and this is, we have now, in a way, in terms of the working patterns, so we got to a slight, we got to a horse, calm moment, and we've got to recognize that. But I just wonder whether, as, as part of business, grapples with that. Or embraces it, or meets the challenge, whatever cliche you want to uh, you want to put in that. I think they've really got to look at how do we genuinely look after our people, because the fact of the matter is that doing your pastoral thirty minutes um, event with your team, and you know we all did it during lockdown. Okay, a member of my team is in the room rolling his eyes now. Just how naff that was by me. Thanks for that. But um, you know, it's it is that really enough? Is that really substituting that sense of who your people are, what do they do, what really sort of what are their views, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. How are you going to run your graduate uh, program, which I know a lot of companies have, where they go away for a day or two and they do those sort of those sort of uh, tasks where they're, they're they're mixing and mingling? Um, and I think all of this. From that to boardrooms, gelling as teams, um, it really needs to be part of the new way of working plan. Um, and the new way of working plan can't just be, have we got the right IT and is this going to work in terms of functionality? The soft bits have to be put in place, if I can put it that way. And, you know, there are bits that we all do and have done for decades uh, in the office, but we've got to make sure that they're not dropped. Uh, as we move on to, to remote platforms. It, it's not insurmountable, but it does require some thought. Um, and my slight concern about it all is that people like me of a certain age and a certain sort of level in an organization 
with a certain sort of, you know, uh, you know lovely place to go and work from home, et cetera, et cetera, um, uh, will be all right, Jack, but it's, it's actually your younger folk who are just entering the workplace, who are just on that tipping point of, you know, views, et cetera, et cetera. We can all remember probably when we were 18 to 21, 22, the, the sort of the experimental way we had of viewing life, et cetera, et cetera. Well, who's, who's mentoring that in the workspace? So, yeah, I do think it's a challenge. And I think, I think it's part of the resilience planning in the new way of working post horse car moment. Somebody needs to be putting some serious thought into this of how do we make sure that our folk are mentored, led, looked after, um, and brought on board and developed in, in a meaningful way. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. And it's just struck me listening to you that when you're talking about these soft bits that have to be put in place and, and the focus on the younger folk as, as this potential tipping point, as you said, Matt, that um, universities, and, and I speak from experience, are, are struggling with the same issues. How do we create a sense of belonging, a sense of identity and share, a shared identity for for our students who are already with us and those who are joining us because the return to university will look incredibly different. Um, I know that many of the businesses and organizations already have relationships with the universities and graduate programs, but I would um, like to suggest that this could be a prime time to really help those universities think about how to create those shared identities, give them practical skills or practical challenges to set their students to. Um, and that might be a point at which you can intervene even further upstream to then pull those employees into your organizations or future employees. Okay, I'm going to pitch one more question for our discussion before we open it up to the Q&A session. I'd like to say thank you to those of you who are submitting questions um, and I will work through those and collate them for the speakers. Um, I would like to just put an idea out there that some of the things that we do in terms of collecting data for our physical security practices and our organizational security practices in the past, of course, weren't really moving into the areas of mental health and well-being. So at what point does that social support, that mental health support and psychological support become the responsibility of the industry or the organization? And at what point is something that really our national health uh, healthcare system needs to talk to. What does the relationship look like between the organizations and that national support or lack thereof for mental health and well-being? Yeah, I, I, I think need to be really clear here. There's nothing I would suggest that this, this should not be about um, employers being expected or any implica implication they're expected to to spy on their employees in any in any sort of intrusive manner, that's not clearly not appropriate. Um, but in your general interest for the welfare of your employees, both as a sort of as a as a responsible employer, employer as well as the core duties that you have under the law, then um, companies are looking at issues like mental health and and sort of and staff support. Have been thinking about welfare and mental health issues around um, people working from home and COVID. Now. As part of that system, being able to spot if someone is in a difficult position. I know companies in the past have looked at, actually, do we have a policy to help people if we spot that an employee may be involved in domestic violence and a victim of that? I think it's those sensible approaches that have trigger mechanisms where you can then do sensible things. It should not be about sort of a spying. My concern is that comp where companies don't have those sensible mechanisms and an opportunity that both protects the company and why society is missed when it was easily taken, not that we should expect companies to be intrusive. Yeah, I just absolutely echo what Mark says. I mean, it, it's not about intruding, but it is about showing a correct level of interest um, and, and looking after your people. And on the one hand, if you want to be cynical, it's because you want them to be productive, creative, uh, and, uh, and, and of benefits the company. Um, being less cynical is because you should really genuinely care for your people. Um, uh, and I think, you know, spotting signs of domestic violence um, from Mark, uh, there's a really good example. 
uh, of where you just look after your people and help them through the tough times of life. Um, but again, I come back to my point, if a third of your workforce is permanently working from home, again, going back to domestic violence, that is going to be difficult to do. So you need to just think through some pretty basic measures of how can you make sure that, um, because you know, obviously domestic violence is an element of extremist behavior, that they're not a victim of that, uh, or indeed that they're not you know, going in other extremist ways. So come, come back to my point, this is something that really people need to think through. If you just, you know, if you're punching the air and thinking it's a brave new world, fantastic, we can do everything on Zoom teams. Absolutely, that's hot. That's that's your productivity piece. But now, tell me how you're going to pick up some of this stuff of mentoring, developing, graduating, graduating, looking out for signs of alcoholism, fraud, um, uh, extremist behaviour, extremist views, um, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Because because I think that's going to be the challenge with this new way of working. Thank you so much. That's very helpful. Um, we are going to move into the Q&A um, session, section of this session. And um, it looks like the trends in the questions coming through, um, some of them are focusing on more global issues and some are focusing on more practical challenges. So I'll open it up for the global issues and the way in which they're going to be reflected in the UK first. So some of the questions in that area um, include, will the US trends affect the nature of our extremism? Um, is it likely that peaceful protest groups might result uh, might result to terrorist acts in support of their causes? So will it will it um, create more interest and support for terrorist acts? And I think a more um, general one as well. If you're thinking about extremism in terms of the corporate risk register, where would you rank that? So the global trends and where that means we would rank extremism in our corporate risk registers. And I'll open that up to both of you, please. Okay. Um... I'll go. I'll go first again, if that's okay, Matt. I think um, in terms of the global trends, uh, as I sort of indicated in my opening, I think the, these things are all globally linked. The way we see right-wing and Islamist groups connecting across the world, throwing their propaganda out there, and it falls in in weird places. I mean, the, was it sort of two years ago in quick succession we had attacks in New Zealand and Sri Lanka. Um, in sort of one sort of, of different types of terrorism, but neither I think were on people top of people's list in terms of the most likely locations for future attacks. Now that sort of illustrates the way these things can propagate it, propagate in unusual ways. I do think the volatility of the world. Um, I think the core, the majority of protest groups like Extinction Rebellion, um, like Black Lives Matter, are about social change and about about peaceful protest, but. Um, they also clearly, in my view, have small groups of people, um, sometimes quite influential in those groups, but small groups of people who are looking to go way beyond that and have sort of fairly extreme left anarchist violent um, views of, of what how, how the world needs to change. And I draw parallels back in history to the animal rights movement, where, again, the vast majority was peaceful. But we did see some individuals associated with it sort of um, blowing up cars of um, directors of various businesses on their drives um, and and the like. So um, I think we have to see a, the core of a protest movement differently to um, one or two marginal factions who will do extreme issues. But it is a threat. If you look at some of the volatile politics that we see in um, I know some parts of Eastern Europe with some pretty extraordinary language, um, some of what's developing in the states and what that may with her, with her around the election and the way these issues connect across the globe. I do think we need to be um, mindful of the, sc the scope for extremism and potentially terrorism to, to whip up issues of, of concern um, for us all in, in, in communities. And some of that can propagate itself into businesses that are on this call. Um, so that goes back to the point I made at starting, volatile world, complex threats, atomized and difficult to deal with and so you have to go back to how you deal with those strategic issues to systemized approaches your protect agenda your um uh, your prevent agenda and your prepare how you test and exercise across all these functions yeah again i agree mark in fact funny enough um i, I have just making some notes here um Brooke, it's almost a question for your students could you name a significant protest movement that hasn't in history 
that has not involved some form of violent or illegal act at, at some stage of its evolution, um, or a splinter group which has done so, whether it's as, and, and last touched on the animal liberation organisations, environmentalists, um, we've now seen sort of beyond politics come out of it, um, Extinction Rebellion, some of the elements of Black Lives Matter, etc, etc. So absolutely, history tells us that however great the cause, however worthy the cause, however fantastic the people that are at the centre of the cause, there is always going to be an element of extremism in them. How much, therefore, should a company uh, look at extremists as a threat, as a risk, rather, on their register? Um, I think they need to be really aware. And I think increasingly, uh, and I sit in the middle of Canary Wharf you know, speaking to you, increasingly companies with globalisation uh, and a spread of services that they offer um, need to be very, very aware of uh, where their services are provided, either to you know, third parties, uh, either directly or to third parties. Um, and that's a sort of external risk of extremism. But also they may have employees who actually believe in the cause uh, on the sort of moderate side, but can be, as other, other security services and others do, but could be you know, brought over or used by the extremist fractions in order to gain information uh, to attack their company. So yeah, I think um, uh, you will all, as I say, here's a challenge. Um, has there ever been a decent cause which hasn't had elements of extremism in it in history? Discuss. Um, no more than 45 minutes essay, please. Um, but if it is the case, then either your company or some of your employees who may be subject to that extremism coming in indirectly. And um, people need to be aware of that. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move us on to some of the more practical questions that have come through as well, um, in terms of thinking about training staff um, and, and the use of online platforms. So let me go through a few of these. We've only got a few minutes and I'll do a very quick summary. So one of the questions from Helen Morris says, online platforms, um, Gab, 4, 8, Chan, use of Telegram and other platforms are being used more frequently as well as gaming platforms. Is there any guidance for corporations to carry out their own open source research on an employee and what they should look out for to indicate extremist views? And I think that goes to the larger question of behavioral, the challenges of spotting behaviors that might indicate extremist views. Um, I've got a PhD student about to deliver a project in that. And it's been really, really interesting, not just looking at behaviors, but also looking at the ability and willingness of, of staff and colleagues to report suspicious behaviors or unusual behaviors. So that might be one point that you'd like to pick up. Another one, another one of the questions looked at training. And uh, it's Ali Leonard said, with ACT training levels being further developed, limitations still apply around the training of front frontline security staff. The Griffin model became a train the trainer facility. Why are NACSO not adopting this to the ACT model, non-online training with those appropriately qualified to do so? Um, and I'll just put that out to both of you. And then once we've heard your answers, I'll follow up with a quick conclusion. Shall I give? Go, go, go Mark. Mark. No, go Mark, because you might want to pick on the one about, uh, you know, it goes back to a point about Where's the legality of looking at what staff are doing? So I was going to let you catch that one, if you don't mind. Yeah, so the legality issue, um, I think in, in a lot of businesses, doing fairly intrusive work to try and look at your staff in their private lives is, is, pro is out of bounds unless you have a sort of legal basis for doing it. Now, I think in some regulated sectors, highly regulated sectors like the financial sector where um, some of the duties and codes and expectations of employees um, in some situations may give you a basis to do that. Um, likewise, of course, if you've had um, uh, something reported to you about an employee and you're doing an investigation, it may sometimes be appropriate. But I think um, there's a, there's a real, there has to be a reasonable expectation of how far to go. Which is why I make the point, this isn't about turning the private sector into investigations. And you'll notice that I used three of the four Ps for you. I didn't put pursue on the list of corporate responsibilities. I think that's inappropriate generally. Um, 
but there will be times where a bit of reaching beyond corporate data is reasonable but that that depends on that depends on your context um and the second issue that brooke raised has gone completely out of my mind which shows i'm, I'm going I, a bit too old no, sorry, I, I think it was about on the mix about the mix of online training and sort of uh personal training and i think look i think this is countering extremism um as a topic is really interesting but it's really difficult and it's really tricky in terms of let's take the environmental cause there are millions of people in this country who feel that more should be done to protect the environment and then there are a few people who will take that to a very extremist view so i think if you're trying to teach and get people aware of where that spectrum sits Doing that online is, for, for me personally, it, it just doesn't work. I think this is something that absolutely needs to be discussed with trained people who can sort of talk about the, um, the subtleties and the legal side of it in, in some really good group discussions. And this is, again, the challenge. Well, everyone, I think most people recognize if you've got 500 people together, most people recognize they're not a terrorist. 500 people also say they're not an extremist, but a few of them actually may be, consciously or unconsciously. And it's that discussion, that sort of classroom, syndicate room discussion that I think is absolutely best delivered uh, in, in the round. Uh, be that as part of graduate training programs, and that's where I think it's absolutely really should be in at, the, in at the start to have those open, frank discussions about what is extremism. Um, but it should be coming up throughout everyone's training, including board level training. But I, th I very much think that they are their discussion topics, not is it answer A, B, C. And so I think it better best done, you know, face to face. And again, I come back to my point. Uh, when you're all remote working or doing the funky new way of working, which you're enjoying, um, then somebody needs to build that into to, into life. I would just come on the back of that before Brooke wraps up. Um, I think the point about the sort of police training model and the sort of help with act and schemes like that. Um, the police have limited capacity in Naxo, and I'm a sort of uh, I'm, I'm two and a half years out of date, but I know some of the challenges faced there. I just wanted to have a brief shout out for um, Julian and Wazi and the Paul Ree team and the work they're doing with the Home Office and Naxo to try and look at how Paul Ree can um, invest in um, uh, strengthening the uh, protective and preventative measures that are in place working with the police um, and so, so sort of taking the role of insurance that step further in terms of risk mitigation um by acting in a preventative capacity not just sort of funding the risk in the same way that we all get the way i understand it is and then they will get encouraged to put good security on our house because it lowers our house insurance premiums um julian's trying to adopt the same approach with um helping the police and home office put in place good housekeeping for corporate so terrorist risk management to keep premiums down and keep the country safer and i think that plays into some of this naxo overstretch question Okay, absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, we've actually we've covered a lot of ground in and not a lot of time. So I will try to do a summary that does justice to the conversations and to the questions. I apologize if I wasn't able to put all of the questions in, um, but I did my best to to um, amalgamate them in order to cover the topics of interest. So it's very clear from this discussion that COVID-19 has accentuated the challenges faced by businesses across the board. Many organizations are struggling uh, for survival and adapting their methods in order to enable their employees to work remotely where possible. They need to also think about how they can do this, um, survive, have all the technology, enable staff to work remotely. How can they accomplish this whilst recognizing the importance and benefits of the psychological and social well-being and resilience of staff, as well as the resilience of the communities in which they work and engage? 
We know that the threat landscape is evolving, but the trends indicate that we cannot decrease, decrease our efforts in terms of thinking about counterterrorism. It's very, very easy to say, oh, this is the risk we'll focus on now, this is the risk we'll focus on later. But it's also important to recognize that a lot of the efforts that you make in one area can build resilience, can build a shared identity, can build a skill set that enable you to prepare and respond for risks and threats across the board. I think that we need to, of course, I would say this because I'm always looking at the way in which we communicate with one another, but also think about the ways in which you're communicating with your staff. Acknowledge that the landscape has changed. Acknowledge that working remotely or going in when there are challenges with social distancing and, and managing infection rates have changed the way in which they work and which the ways in which they interact and the ways in which the way that they might feel about their role and their job. Think about physical security um, and talk about good practice. So carry on doing that. But also think about ways in which you can increase a shared identity and a shared purpose and um, focus on fostering this across the board, make time for it. If people aren't spending three hours a day commuting, then can they spend some time in terms of having smaller, more intimate conversations with their colleagues, problem solving in a less pressurized environment? We've, we have seen from research in the past, when we look at the ability or the likelihood and willingness of um, members of the public or employees from critical national infrastructure organizations to come to work during a CBRN type event, one of the issues that we actually looked at in that study was pandemic influenza, was very, very heavily influenced by the importance that they thought, felt that their role did, not just for the organization, but for the company. So do they understand that their piece of the puzzle, that their job in the organization and the organization's role in society is valued and valuable? Also think about the future. What kind of landscape are we creating across the industry, the world of industry, but also what kind of landscape are we creating around the world? If there are job cuts, if there aren't opportunities for internships or graduate programs. We have many levers that are available for us to pull, but I think that if we, if we think across the P's that, that we use and the other industry and organizational approaches to thinking about risk and threat, we also have to consider not just functioning, not just carrying on day to day, but about the transformation and the adaptations that we need to, to make when thinking about those levers and the tools that we have to think about physical security, but also to think about the psychological um, uh, well-being of our staff. Speak to one another. Don't assume that concerns that you share are only um, concerns that are relevant to your industry. I'm certain that others will be sharing them too. And also don't assume that they will be addressed by other parts of society, by government or by other industries. Actually sit down and say, I'm concerned about this. How is it being addressed in my organization? Do any of my colleagues in other organizations share this concern, share this risk, and how are they addressing it? You might find that there are there that there are solutions that are available that you haven't considered, but you all might also find that there's a big black hole in terms of information. And this is the point where your where your employees are likely to possibly fall through the cracks. And you can work with others to put something in place in order to identify those challenges. Um, and I'm going to um, round off here by thanking Robert again for bringing us all together and for creating the opportunity to have this dialogue and this discussion. And also thanking Mark and Matt for sharing their experience and their insights as we move forward into the future. Thank you very much. And on behalf of uh, Resilience First and all the participants in this afternoon, I'd just like to reinforce what Brooke said and offer my thanks to the speakers and to the chair uh, for their superb contributions uh, today. We will be circulating a short summary, including Brooke's slides, in due course. Uh, and so I will simply close uh, with saying that we have another webinar on the 22nd of September on climate change. And I hope you can join us then. So I'll leave by saying thank you and stay safe. Goodbye.